It being Senator O'Neill, you have well, I just want to draw the no attention. time at all. <laughs> Sorry, Senator O'Neill. It, it, it is now after 2 p.m. and under the, uh, under the order of business. We must move to question time. I'm sure you'd agree, Senator Keneally. Um, Sen Senator Keneally, you have the call. All right. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. National Senator Matt Canavan has said if Mr Morrison adopts net zero emissions by 2050 without the approval of the Nationals, and I quote, it will be ugly. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Mr Canavan? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Keneally, for your question. I think it will be ugly. I think it will be ugly. I do agree. I agree with uh, Senator Canavan. Um, you'll have to check with Barnaby if he doesn't. But what we're doing as a political party is carefully considering uh, the proposal before us. And this proposal will set up um, a net zero position for our country over the next three decades. And it's only right and proper that the party that represents miners, the party that represents foresters and fishers, manufacturing workers, the party that represents farmers and those that live out in rural and regional Australia, assesses the impact of this decision on Order. our communities. And not just between now and the next election, not just between now and our own political careers, but between now uh, and the three decades that this policy will be rolled out and will have uh, impact. And we're doing that in a calm, methodical way. We're doing it on behalf of the regions. It is actually the right and proper process uh, to, to go through. And our party room has primacy in this. It's not our leader having a top-down approach on what should and shouldn't happen to our communities or what should and shouldn't happen to our industries. It is each and every National Party MP and Senator feeding into the leadership group uh, what uh, they think uh, will be the implications and what their views are, and we're taking those forward as a group. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Mr Joyce has declared that if Mr Morrison adopts net zero by 2050 without the Nationals' blessing, it could be, quote, a very hard time for the government and, quote, not what you want for harmonious government. What does the Deputy Prime Minister mean by that? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, I think, as I said yesterday, we have a very successful coalition government for 75 years, delivering outcomes for our nation and for the regions as a result of our shared values and commitment to deliver. Sometimes we disagree, very rarely, but we do disagree. Uh, and it is important that when we have periods of disagreement that it is a respectful conversation. Uh, and that is exactly how we are conducting uh, this negotiation. And so, well, Order. and so I, you know, I think it would be best, obviously, for the coalition uh, that we come to an agreement. But we've made very clear uh, we're not agreeing to anything that isn't right for the regions. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, Senator Canavan refused to guarantee there would be no resignations if Mr Morrison adopted net zero emissions by 2050 without the approval of the Nationals. How many Nationals are at risk of resigning if the Morrison-Joyce government adopts net zero by 2050? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, talking about resignations over climate change policy, uh, the, and going to you know, what nationals may or may not do is uh, a, a hypothetical question. But I tell you who has actually resigned over climate change policy, and that is Joel Fitzgibbon. A great loss to the hunter, a great loss to those that care about mining jobs in this country, a great loss 
for the, Nas for the Labor Party. He should be a National Minister, Party uh, MP, Minister, but a great Minister, loss to the Labor Party. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order is direct relevance. The minister is straying into areas that have nothing to do with the question. It was specifically about the National Party and comments about National Party resignations made by a member of the National Party. Uh, Senator Keneally, the minister was addressing the issue of resignations over climate policy. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I will have allowed you to draw the minister's attention back to the question, but Senator, uh, Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. And talking about resignations of candidates and MPs, it was the uh, candidate for Fowler, I think, that actually pulled out of the pre-selection race. Minister. Senator Wong, do you have Thank a point you, of order? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, um, the point of order is direct relevance. Uh, the use of a verb doesn't mean that anything associated potentially with the verb is directly relevant. We accept, I think Senator, um, the former president uh, talked about glancing references to the opposition. We understand that's part of the, the interplay of question time, but this is a minister who has asked about nationals resigning. That is the question. We'd ask it to be directly relevant. I'm uh, a, I, no, no, no. Well, I, I'm happy to move leave for Senator no, Canavan to no, speak no, no. for two minutes. I'm happy no. to give him leave. Senator Wong. If, the, Senator if Wong. the government will give Senator him leave, Wong. we will give him have leave. Have you finished your point I of have. order? Is this on the point of order? Order, uh, Mr. President. The question was clearly about resignations, and uh, Senator Keneally has great experience here enforcing the resignation of a Labor Senator candidate uh, for the Senator lower house. Canavan. So this is directly relevant to the question's experience. I am, I am listening carefully, Senator Wong. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You have had the chance again to draw the minister's attention back to the question. I cannot direct the minister how to answer the question. She was dealing with matters raised within the question. I have a submission, Mr. President. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, with respect, I'd ask you post question time to take advice from the clerk and look at the hand side. We are not asking you to direct her how to answer the question. We are asking you to make a ruling to uphold the standing orders as to direct relevance. And I put it to you, and I'd ask you to get advice and consider the hand side, that a question which goes to the nationals resigning from cabinet over nationals resigning, which is what Senator Canavan put on the public record, appropriate question to the deputy prime minister's representative, cannot possibly be directly cannot possibly be answered in a directly relevant way by reference uh, to an entirely different matter. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, in considering the matters that, uh, that Senator Wong has raised, I would draw to your attention the fact that uh, Senator McKenzie uh, very clearly went specifically to matters of National Party ministers and their current representation in the current ministerial arrangements in the very first part of her response. It is, having addressed directly the direct question asked, entirely appropriate for a minister to be able to give context, including historical context, in relation uh, to, uh, Order, to uh, such Wong. answers that have been given. Uh, it is entirely appropriate for a minister uh, to be able to elaborate on a point that they're making. Um, and in elaborating, uh, that may mean that they are adding further context and information to what they have uh, provided in terms of a direct response to the question that was asked, Mr President. I, I, I have ruled on the point of order. I will come back to the chamber and I will uh, seek uh, further information on this particular issue and previous rulings that have been made. Uh, my ruling, however, stands. Minister Mackenzie, did you wish to continue? I was going to uh, put on the record, I think, Joel Fitzgibbon, a resigning member of the Labor Party. He resigned from the executive of the Labor Party, uh, the shadow executive, and uh, specifically on resigning around climate policy. He says the Labor Sen Party has not made one Senator contribution. McKenzie, resume your seat. Senator Van. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, with Australia reaching the national double-dose milestone of 70 per cent, 
How is the Liberal and National Government's plan to secure our COVID recovery, supporting Australians to gain skills and helping keep Australia's pipeline of skilled workers flowing? Uh, I call the Minister. Mr President, and I thank Senator Van for the question and congratulations to Australians for reaching that 70 per cent milestone. Uh, again, it shows that we're all working together in terms of that pathway well and truly out of COVID-19. And Mr President, in terms of vocational education and training, it's something that employers are looking for in prospective employees. It ensures that they are work ready from day one. And the Morrison government, in terms of our investment, we are well and truly investing in a world-class vocational education and training system. Mr President, our government, at the outset of COVID-19 and at the start of the pandemic, we invested approximately $6 billion in skills funding at the commencement of COVID-19. This was the largest single investment to occur in vocational education and training ever in Australia. And Mr President, as a government, we recognise the benefits of vocational education and training, and that is why we are now investing an additional $6.4 billion over the 2021-2022 financial year. So what we now see from the Morrison government is an investment of over $12 billion in skills funding since the start of the pandemic. And what this has seen is whilst other countries have actually shed their apprentice workforces, what we have seen in Australia, and in particular because of the successful Boosting Apprenticeship Commencement Program that we put in place, new apprentices, new apprentices in Australia increased 141.5 per cent year on year. That is because of the investments that the Morrison government, the coalition government, has put in place to ensure that we are helping those businesses who wanted to keep their apprentices keep them on, but also ensuring that those businesses who wanted to bring on apprentices had the right policies in place Minister, to do your that. time has expired. Senator Van, a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how many Australians and Australian businesses have benefited from the government's investment in boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And this is a highly successful investment made by the coalition government in terms of bringing apprentices on into the workforce. This is a highly successful program, and what we've now seen is around 224,000 Australians take on an apprenticeship right across Australia. What we've also seen now is over 77,000 businesses they have successfully utilised this program, taking on another apprentice, or in the case of some businesses, they have been able to grow their business and take on multiple apprentices. What we do under the program is businesses who take on a new apprentice, they now get 50 per cent of that apprentice's wage, up to $7,000 per quarter, subsidised by the government for a period of 12 months. Months. So for businesses out there, you have until the 31st of March 2022 to take advantage of this wage subsidy. Senator Van, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will the extension of the government's successful boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy help keep the skilled workers' pipeline flowing now and into the future? Minister. Mr President, one of the goals of this particular policy is to now protect the pipeline of the apprentices today so that they become the skilled workforce that employers can have access to tomorrow. We have now expanded this successful program, the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencement Wage Subsidy, with an additional $716 million. Again, that is because we understand you put in place those policies that employers can lever off to grow their workforces. They can bring on apprentices, they can bring on trainees, they can offer Australians that opportunity to be trained to be work ready from day one. And we have seen with a number of businesses who have accessed the policies and the number number of Australians who have been given an opportunity across Australia that this is a highly successful program. And again, we put in place those policies that employers can lever off so that they can get that skilled pipeline of workers that they need. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rustin. 
The Cabinet Handbook, which makes it clear it applies to the whole ministry, not simply those ministers in the Cabinet, requires that, and I quote, members of the Cabinet must publicly support all government decisions made in the Cabinet, even if they do not agree with them. Does Minister Pitt accept this obligation to Cabinet solidarity? The Minister representing the Minister for Water, Senator Russell. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Gallagher for her question. Well, obviously, um, as you would expect, all ministers in the Morrison-Joyce government accept their responsibilities under the ministerial code in relation to their obligations very, very seriously. Um, however, I mean, obviously, um, as, uh, as Minister Pitt has made uh, a number of comments in relation to um, to issues that he feels very strongly about, and obviously he has the right to make those comments and those decisions. But, of course, as a government, we, uh, we remain absolutely committed um, to sticking together. And as Senator McKenzie, I think, has made, has made, uh, had made comment today um, on many, many occasions, Order. and yesterday and the day before, and uh, I think she's probably very relieved that the first, you know, she's only had one question today. I mean, I thought you might have uh, continued with your track record of this week of asking Senator McKenzie every question from uh, from that side of the chamber. But the one thing that this government does, uh, the National Party and the Liberal Party in coalition, is that we work together respectfully to make sure that we deal Order. with the issues that are important to Australians, important to all Order. Australians. Australians that live in the city and Australians that live in rural and regional areas, because it is incumbent on all governments to make sure that we canvass the concerns of every Australian when we make very important policy decisions. And Minister Pitt, just as I and many other ministers in this government, um, are expressing in this debate, respectfully amongst ourselves, Order. the views of the constituencies of which Order, we Senator represent. Reed. And I think you know we have seen through the responses that you have received from Senator McKenzie over uh, the recent days just how respectful that that conversation is. And I can assure you that we will continue to have a respectful conversation with the people of Australia Order on this very, on very left. important policy decision of Senator our climate Keneally. policy going forward, because it matters to Australians. It matters to them about what this is going to cost, and it matters how we plan to Minister, get there. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Does Minister Pitt support the Prime Minister's position that the Australian government needs to adopt a net zero by 2050 commitment? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Mr. President. Um, the whole government supports a platform and a plan that allows the Australian uh, economy to be able to transition to a low emissions Order. future by Order. developing a plan. Oh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Gallagher, on a point. Direct uh, relevance. The question had no preamble. It was directly so, Minister, about the minister's. <laughs> Minister Pitt's support for the Prime Minister's position. It, wasn't, it was a very direct, purposely drafted directly to that type question. And, and I will continue. Uh, did you have a submission, Minister? Or? Uh, uh, Senator Gallagher, allow me to rule. Um, you raised a point of order. In my opinion, I was listening carefully to the Minister. She was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, right now, we are in the midst of a respectful conversation, not only between the two parties of the coalition government, but with the Australian public, about a plan to make sure that we move to a clean energy future. Now, we have not made any decisions in relation to the finality of that, and so to come in here and make a whole heap of assumptions about things, we will continue to work respectfully Order. amongst our coalition partners Order. to make sure that we deliver a future, an energy future, that does not provide cause households to pay higher Order. energy prices, doesn't cause businesses to have to pay higher costs, and doesn't put Australians out of work, particularly in our regions. Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. The answer was no. Senator Gallagher, you Thank second you. supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. One of Minister Pitt's own colleagues has reportedly said, and I quote, "He should go. He clearly doesn't agree, and it's not conducive to cabinet solidarity." Will Minister Pitt resign? Minister. Hmm. Uh, well, well, firstly, just to put, set the record um, correctly, um, Minister Pitt is not 
in Cabinet. Uh, Minister Pitt is in the outer ministry. However, as I have said and as Senator McKenzie said and as so many people on this side of the chamber have said, that we are having a respectful conversation about our plan to get to a clean energy future. We understand our obligations in relation to emissions reduction, but we understand their obligations to the Australian public our obligations to make sure that we don't tax them out of existence. We do not add a burden, a financial burden, to, to households' energy bills, that we don't add a burden to businesses that, that put them at a competitive disadvantage to the rest of the world, and that we make sure that we Order. actually protect Australian jobs, Order, Australian jobs in all sectors. We are absolutely committed to deliver what we said we're going to deliver, but we will do it by technology and we are not going to tax the Australian population and economy out of existence. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Today, the New South Wales ICAC has received explosive evidence from a frank and fearless public servant about the dodgy clay target grant for the Maguire International Shooting Centre of Excellence. It's reminiscent of sports rorts pork and ride and all the other times the audit office has repeatedly found that the government prioritised coalition and marginal seats in grant funding in the lead-up to the last election. Why is your government's model for a corruption body designed to not be able to look back at the misuse of public funds? Is it because half your cabinet have been implicated in integrity scandals? Uh, the Attorney General, Minister, uh, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and Senator Waters. Um, I will take it just as trite commentary. Uh, the end of your question. Um, the Morrison government, as you know, uh, we have Order. made it very clear uh, on our intent, Mr. President, to establish a Commonwealth Order. Integrity Commission. And in fact, Mr. President, uh, we have already put in place the required funding for when the Commonwealth Integrity Commission is passed. Order, Senator, uh, Senator Waters, you may be aware that we have actually committed $106.7 million of new money to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. This was in addition to the $40.7 million uh, in funding that we have provided for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, which will actually transfer to the Commission, which will take it to a total of $147.4 million. Uh, you'll also be aware uh, this is incredibly important legislation, uh, and we need to ensure that the model is the right model. And as such, we have conducted a nationwide consultation process uh, on exposure Order. draft legislation to establish the Commission, and in fact, 333 submissions were received, detailed submissions, 46 consultations, meetings and round tables were occur uh, occurred during the consultation period. Oh, sorry, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Just a point of order on relevance. My question went to whether the model would uh, be able to investigate all of the rorts. I know the answer is no, but the minister needs to address that question. The, the, uh, as you say, Senator Waters, your question addressed the model. Uh, the, the minister was being directly relevant as to the model Attorney General. Uh, thank you. And as I said, we are consulting on the model. That was what the exposure draft legislation was all about. And the government is now considering the feedback on the model. Senator Waters, a supplementary yes, question. Yes, thank you, President. It's been more than a thousand days since this government said it would introduce an integrity commission, and yet two years ago, my bill for a strong, independent corruption watchdog passed this Senate. But you've refused to bring it on for debate in the House. The Centre for Public Integrity recently ranked that model as gold standard, and your government's model as the weakest in the nation. Why won't you bring on my bill for debate so the Australian people can have the robust, effective corruption watchdog it deserves? The Attorney General. Well, Senator Waters, you obviously did not listen to my previous answer. The government has its own model uh, that is, it is putting forward. We have sent out the exposure draft legislation. We have received extensive feedback on the exposure draft legislation, and we are now considering the feedback on the exposure draft legislation. And that extensive feedback 
through that consultation process, and I took you through the consultation process, it was an extensive consultation process, will now inform the further enfriment uh, of the draft legislation. Senator Waters, a second supplementary. Yes, thanks, President. Liberal backbenchers Ms Katie Allen, Mr Dave Sharma and Ms Celia Hammond have all called for a stronger model that includes a broad definition of corruption, public hearings and letting the Commission initiate its own investigations. Meanwhile, Mr Barnaby Joyce described a strong corruption watchdog as a Spanish inquisition that makes politi politicians terrified to do their job. Will you listen to those in your party calling for stronger measures or are the nationals in charge of integrity policy too? Attorney General. Well, again, this would appear to be your second supplementary, which mirrored your first supplementary, which actually mirrored your primary question. Again, we have undertaken an extensive consultation process. Mr. President, this is an important piece of legislation. Um, it is important that we get the details of the legislation right. That is why the government released the exposure draft of the legislation. That is why we are considering the 333 written submissions to take on board the feedback. And as I have already articulated, uh, the feedback that we have received will now inform the further refinement of this draft legislation. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals government childcare policies are supporting Australian families and businesses, and how will they help secure Australia's COVID recovery? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. We know how important childcare is for thousands of Australian families, and that's why the Morrison government has delivered a targeted, measured childcare package that is keeping out-of-pocket expenses low and allowing more parents to work should they choose. Average out-of-pocket costs are now just around $4 per hour, almost 18 per cent lower before our childcare package was introduced more than three years ago. The mechanism we introduced to restrain fee growth, the cap on hourly fees, is also working with 86.2 per cent of services charging below that cap. But we know that these costs still add up when you have two, three or more children in care at the same time. So we're bringing forward an additional support for around 250,000 families with two or more children in care. These, fam these families will re receive Order. an additional 30 per cent subsidy, covering up to 95 per cent of their costs. So a family earning $110,000 a year with two kids in care four days a week will be better off by around $100 a week. Mr President, we said we'd introduce this earlier if we could, and now we are delivering. The work we've done to ensure that the IT framework is ready and in place and centres will be prepared is underway. Mr President, we're bringing these measures forward to March next year, saving the average family with two children in care around $700 per week this financial, $700 this financial year and $2,200 a year going forward. The Morrison government is committed to increasing economic opportunities for Australian women and families, and this additional childcare support will help remove disincentives for primary carers, particularly mothers, to participate in the workforce. This is especially important as our economy begins to open up, providing women with more choices and more chances to enter or re-enter the workforce. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline the economic impact of this measure? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks to these measures, the equivalent of around 40,000 parents, largely working mothers, will be able to work an additional day per week, boosting the economy by around $1.5 billion per year, right at a time next year when our economy in recovery will be in full swing. Mr President, it's not just families with two children that will benefit from our reforms. We're also scrapping the $10,655 annual childcare subsidy cap effective from this year. And this will be applied retrospectively for the whole of the 2021-22 financial year, meaning anyone who reaches the cap before this date will have an additional out-of-pocket out costs for the 2021-22 financial year reimbursed. Mr President, it's estimated that around 82,000 families in just Senator Hughes' home state of New South Wales will benefit from this measure. Bringing forward the subsidy means that, uh, and removing that cap will have an incredibly positive impact on families right across the nation. Senator Hughes, a second. Thank you, 
Can thank, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please explain to the Senate who this child court care support is targeted at and how this differs from previous policy arrangements? Minister. Thank you very much, Senator, Senator Hughes. Mr. President, the Morrison government's child care support targets those who need it the most those on lower incomes and those with multiple children. In fact, around 60 per cent of all subsidies paid go to families on less than $150,000. More than 70 per cent of families pay less than $5 an hour, while almost a quarter pay less than $2 an hour. Mr President, there are around 280,000 more children in childcare now than there were when we came to office with women's workforce participation reaching record highs of 61.9 per cent in March this year, and that remains near record highs. Let's compare this to Labor's reckless childcare scheme that would benefit millionaires the most. In fact, around $1.1 billion of Labor's policy per year would go to those earning over $250,000 a year, and a couple earning half a million dollars a year would get a $50,000 taxpayer subsidied payment. Outrageous largesse. Mm, Minister, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communication and Regional Education, Senator McKenzie. Does the Minister support net zero emissions by 2050? Uh, the Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Wong, for your question. I've written uh, a couple of pieces which outline my views on this matter, well, uh, going back several months. Uh, I am not an MP that has come to this place ever denying the science of climate change, but nor am I an MP that has ever signed up to, to a member of parliament, a member of parliament uh, who's ever signed up to um, policies that will decimate jobs in rural and regional Australia. And over the time Order. I've been in this place, there has been a number of debates that, and a number of debates uh, in this place, and my political party has stood up uh, for rural and regional Australians and for jobs in our communities. Uh, and we will continue to do that. I've made it very clear in my personal public commentary that I will not be signing up to any policy that is not right for rural and regional Australia, not just to get us through the next election, but to Order. get us through the next three decades. Senator Pratt. And it is very, um, it's very easy for those who don't live in the communities that we live in and represent the communities we represent to take, to take a, a different approach. Very, very similar to, you know, like you see Senator Canavan lives in a community that is based around coal mining. But when you look at Anthony Albanese's perspective on coal mining, lives nowhere near it. I don't think there is a place for new coal-fired power plants in Australia Full Senator, stop. Minister, Full stop. Minister, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong, I would point out there is only six seconds left. I'm happy to take the point of order. That doesn't prevent a I know. point of order. I'm Mr. happy to President. take the point yeah, no, of order. Thank you. I was uh, just pointing uh, yes. it out. Uh, direct relevance. Demonstrably not directly relevant. Uh, the minister was clearly being directly relevant in the first part of her question. I agree that towards the end she strayed from direct relevance. However, uh, the minister was being directly relevant through the, the answer to the question. And you certainly, uh, you have six seconds, uh, Senator McKenzie. Do you wish to continue? All right, uh, Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the minister support the prime minister's position that the Australian government needs to adopt a net zero by 2050 commitment. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Wong, for your question. I support the Prime Minister pursuing a technology, not taxes, approach to lowering our emissions in this Order. country. Absolutely. We, this, as a species, the human species over Order. eons. Order. 
has progressed Senator through the adoption of technologies. Now, the National Party in the Senate has been very, very clear. Uh, we moved amendments and tabled amendments when it came to clean energy Order. financing that backed the low uh, emissions technologies of carbon capture and storage. And I really wish we could get Larissa Waters and her team onto how we actually can protect jobs at the simultaneously lowering emissions, and that is through those types of technologies. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Direct relevance again. This minister is flagrantly ignoring the direction you've provided her in question no. time. She is well raising issues about the leader of the Greens in a question about whether she supports the Prime Minister's commitment on net zero cannot be directly relevant to the question she asked. She was asked. The, the, the minister She's was avoiding it. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. As has been made clear by previous uh, occupants of this chair. Uh, glancing references to other parties and glancing references uh, to the policies of other parties is acceptable. Uh, it does need to be a glancing reference. At this stage, I do not believe it could be described as more than that. Um, Senator McKenzie did. Uh, Senator McKenzie was addressing the question. Uh, Senator McKenzie, you have nine seconds. Did you wish to continue? Um, so when we talk about the Prime Minister's plan and our government's plan to use technology, not taxes, to lower emissions in this country, get on board with some of your smart Senator unions McKenzie. who actually are backing Senator nuclear. McKenzie. I'm not sure what happened with the clocks there. It went to. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm not sure what happened there, but the clock suddenly went to zero. So um, I will continue. A second supplementary. Thank you. Final second supplementary. If the minister isn't prepared to support the prime minister publicly and here in the parliament, is she prepared to resign from his cabinet? Minister. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. President. I don't know how you're going to rule on this one if I say that's a hypothetical question. And once again, Senator Wong is uh, scoping out using question time to cheaply score political points. What I would like to know from the Australian Labor Party is Order, whether Senator they Wong. actually support regional jobs, Senator whether they Gallagher. actually back Merrill and Order. Joel and actually On back the mining left. industry in this country. At least the forestry division Senator of the Wong. CFMMU has the guts to stand up for workers. Why doesn't the mining division, why isn't the construction division? If you actually cared about Minister, workers in this country, Minister, you would be standing up. Minister, Senator Wong. Thank you, I Mr. President. I was calling the minister to order. Thank you. I just note that over that period of time, some more time was wasted, again on some, on matters entirely irrelevant to a question that was clearly about her obligations as a cabinet minister. How can what the CFMEU Forestry Division does be relevant in any way to her this minister's obligations as a cabinet minister. Minister. Yes, I was an officer of that union. What's that got to do with anything? Sen Sen no, no, no. It's about this her is not as a, a cabinet time minister. For debate across the chamber. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Minister, you have 17 seconds left. Senator Wong has called your attention back to the question. I would, I, Senator Wong, please do not interrupt me when I'm making a ruling. Senator, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong has brought your attention, attention back to the question. You have 16 seconds remaining. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm sorry that my comments uh, and me not accepting the premise of your question actually upset you so much, Senator Wong. I know it's been a while since no, you've been in no, cabinet. That's fine. Uh, but the hand Minister. <laughs> no. Sorry, Senator Wong. Go ahead. Mission. Is this a you point of the, order, Senator? A point of order on direct relevance. You gave the minister the courtesy, as the president should, uh, of reminding her that I had drawn her to the question. She has abused the graciousness of the chair and simply then gone proceeded on exactly the same tack. Um, no, uh, I, I disagree, Senator Wong. Um, the minister is entitled to reject the premise, premise of the question. Uh, Senator McKenzie, you have three seconds left. Do you, Senator McKenzie? 
I, more than any other, are very aware of Your cabinet time standards has and the minister. Senator Mackenzie. Senator Scar. Order. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's partnership with Papua New Guinea, our closest neighbour, in response to the current COVID-19 third wave? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. I thank Senator Scar for his question and particularly for his interest in this very important area. The COVID-19 situation in Papua New Guinea Papua New Guinea is very concerning as we're seeing a new surge in cases associated with the Delta strain and it is placing significant pressure on the health system. Uh, both the Prime Minister and I have spoken with our Papua New Guinea colleagues uh, to discuss the challenges that they're dealing with, including to assure them that Australia is standing, is standing by them at this very difficult time. Since the start of the pandemic, we've been partnering closely with the government of Papua New Guinea on their needs. That includes over two million pieces of PPE testing equipment and supplies, oxygen concentrators and pressurised air masks, over 100,000 genomic tests with support from Melbourne's Doherty Institute to identify COVID-19 variants of concern, and support to enable increased provincial health service delivery through ch church health services. We have now deployed five Australian medical assistance or OSMAT teams to Papua New Guinea to provide critical care planning and clinical care. We're now providing further assistance as Papua New Guinea responds to this most recent concerning surge in cases. That includes partnering on the reopening of the Nightingale Centre to increase the capacity of Port Moresby General Hospital and support to important provincial health authorities to maintain their essential operations. We're supporting Papua New Guinea to vaccinate more frontline health workers and expanding commercial vaccination hubs, including in major urban centres like Leigh. The Australian Defence Force is providing logistics support and vaccination training to the Papua New Guinea Defence Force, and I acknowledge the exceptional working relationship between the PNGDF and the ADF. Australia will continue to meet Papua New Guinea's vaccine supply needs and support their vaccination rollout program in partnership with the Papua New Guinean government. Senator Scar, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the fabulous work of the Australian Medical Assistance Team members in Papua New Guinea? Minister. I thank uh, Senator Scar for his uh, supplementary question. It is indeed exceptional work that those OSMAT teams are doing. A seven-person OSMAT-led team arrived in Port Moresby this last Saturday uh, on a flight that also delivered 40 of the oxygen concentrators that I referred to earlier. It's led by one of OSMAT's most experienced doctors, Dr Mark Little. The team includes a nurse practitioner, a public health specialist, as well as logistics experts. Uh, I would acknowledge and thank Dr Little and the greater uh, multiple OSMAT teams who have deployed to Papua New Guinea and the Pacific uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. The team has strong experience partnering with Papua New Guinea's health officials. They will be in PNG for three weeks. They'll work closely with the Ministry of Health and the important National Control Centre. The team will identify further priorities for assistance, including cl additional clinical support to manage the surge and medical equipment that can be deployed within Papua New Guinea's health system. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Mr President, can the minister outline Australia's work with Papua New Guinea to support their vaccination program? Minister. I thank again Senator Scar for the question. Last night, Australia delivered a further 60,000 vaccine doses to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we're committed to working with them to meet the needs of the country. Uh, we're partnering with the government, with business and with NGOs to promote the importance of vaccinations, and we've launched a campaign with the Papua New Guinea Council of Churches to address hesitancy issues. Uh, the ADF is providing logistic support in the Torres Strait border region, where vaccination rates are now the highest uh, in Papua New Guinea. An Australian-funded clinic in Port Moresby uh, has itself administered over 13 per cent of the vaccinations administered nationally. We're supporting pop-up clinics at convenient locations like shopping centres. Australian experts are also working with PNG and the WHO on a plan to expand and accelerate the rollout, prioritising those provinces with the highest numbers of cases. Uh, Senator Faruqi has the call. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. 
The climate impacts of your coal, oil, and gas-loving government are being felt first and foremost by nations who did nothing to create this crisis, including our Pacific neighbors, who are watching their children's future disappear underwater. Yet Australia has abjectly failed to deliver its share of climate finance as committed to in the Copenhagen Accord. A report by the Climate Action Network Australia released today has calculated Australia's fair share to be $3 billion over 2020-2025 and $12 billion annually by 2030. Now that we know that Mr Morrison will show up at COP26, will he commit to increasing Australia's measly climate finance contribution to pay our fair share or will Australia remain an international outlier on climate? The Minister for International Development, Senator Sazelja. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, and I thank the Senator for the question. Um, the short answer to the question uh, is that Australia has uh, made a strong commitment to climate finance, including in the Pacific. Um, and that includes, uh, between 2020 and 2025, uh, $1.5 billion, with uh, at least $500 million of that going to uh, the Pacific. So that's to directly answer your question. There are a number of uh, other pejoratives uh, in your question, some of which I'll, I'll seek to address. But when it comes to the issue of uh, climate finance, uh, we will have more to say uh, going forward. But when it comes to doing our bit, uh, we absolutely reject the Greens' constant, incorrect, inadequate uh, assertions that we are somehow not doing our bit when it comes to climate change. Now, you know, we hear from the Greens constantly. Uh, they parrot it. They talk our, our country down, and they ignore the facts. They ignore the facts. Uh, and when I'm speaking with Pacific leaders, uh, we deal with the facts rather than the assertions that are made by the Greens. And those facts include that we have reduced our emissions by 20 per cent since 2005. And when we compare that to other uh, similar economies around the world, uh, we are doing far more than our bit. When you look at countries like Canada, uh, where we are well ahead, when you look at the OECD average of wealthy nations, we are well ahead. We have reduced our emissions but at a faster rate than places like US uh, and Japan and the OECD average. So the Greens might want to put forward uh, this assertion, which is completely not based in fact, which is in fact incorrect. You might want to talk our country down when it comes to these actions, but whether we're talking to our Pacific neighbours or whether we are going onto the world stage more broadly, we have a proud record. Uh, and we will do our bit and continue to do our bit and work with countries in the region and beyond uh, to deal with these challenging issues. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, Australia was instrumental in discussions at COP15 that led to the establishment of the Green Climate Fund. But since 2018, the Liberal National Government has contributed zero dollars to the Green Climate Fund. Why did the Australian Government abrogate its responsibility and stop contributing to the Green Climate Fund? And will you commit any money to this fund again? Minister. Uh, well, in terms, in terms of uh, specific issues around the Green Climate Fund, uh, they will be. Uh, they are decisions uh, that will be made, uh, not by not by me. Uh, I will say, but uh, but when it comes to the the history and when it comes to contributing to climate finance, we have made uh, our intent clear, and we have done it uh, in all sorts of ways, as I outlined uh, in the answer to your first question. And going forward. Uh, we have committed $1.5 billion uh, to climate finance around the world, uh, with at least $500 million of that to go to the Pacific. And as I said earlier, uh, we intend to make further announcements in that space. Uh, but I go to the point. Uh, Australia is doing its bit, will continue to do its bit. Uh, we do it in a way uh, that protects our economy. Uh, we do it in a way that works with our partners in the region. We take our responsibilities uh, to our Pacific family uh, very seriously. We're not going to be lectured to by the Greens on how we should do that, uh, but we have a proud record uh, despite your attempts to talk it down. Senator Faruqi, a second supplementary question. Minister, when the world was debating solutions to climate change, you were still fighting over whether it is real or not. Now we are in the critical decade and the world has moved on to establish meaningful 2030 targets, the Liberals and Nationals are having a brawl over 2050 targets. When will you stop being laggards, listen to science, and increase your miserable targets to the strong action our communities and our Pacific neighbours are demanding? 
Minister. Well, thank you. I thank the senator for the question. We certainly won't be taking our lead from the Greens when it comes to our response on climate change or very few other issues, it must be said. Now, the Labor Party might take their lead from the Greens when it comes to responding to climate change. Uh, they may well, and we've seen that in the past. And the big danger for this country is if they were in government again, that they'd take their lead from you. And we got an insight into that from Senator Gallagher just this week uh, when she left open the possibility of bringing back a carbon tax if the Labor Party come back in. So we know that if, if there's a Labor Greens government in the future, the Greens will be pushing for a carbon tax. The shadow finance minister says all options are on the table, including the carbon tax. So we won't be following your advice when it comes to responding to climate change. We won't be following the Labor Party's advice. And, we, and, and the Australian people need to understand that if there was a change of government, it would be the Greens dictating to the Labor Party who say they are open to bringing a carbon Minister, tax back. your time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. We are now 20 months into this pandemic and the Delta strain is ripping through Papua New Guinea, a mere four kilometres away from Australia. Isn't Senator Fieravanti Wells right to say that this government, and I quote, has dropped the ball, has dropped the ball on providing urgent support to our most, most important Pacific partners? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. I absolutely reject Senator Wong's question, and I absolutely reject the proposition uh, that is apparently put by Senator Fierro of Auntie Wells, which I have not actually heard. As I said in response to the previous question from Senator Scar, who has a deep and abiding interest in these issues, we have been working very closely, in particular with uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, let me repeat, for the benefit of the Chamber, that. Working in partnership with another government involves recognising their sovereignty, their leadership and their uh, systems uh, to address some of the most significant challenges that they are dealing with in the context of a global pandemic. There is no doubt whatsoever that for Papua New Guinea, for Timor-Leste, for Fiji, for a number of countries that have dealt with significant surges of COVID-19 in the region that this has been a very difficult period, and each government has dealt with it in their own way. I acknowledge particularly the efforts that the government of Fiji has made to reach such high vaccination levels amongst uh, its population. I acknowledge the work that Papua New Guinea is doing and has been doing for a very long time in extremely difficult circumstances across perhaps the most complex geography you can possibly imagine to try to address uh, the challenges of COVID-19. Mentioned in my remarks the, uh, in, in response to the previous question, the Order. personal protective equipment and testing equipment and supplies we've de delivered, the oxygen concentrators, the pressurised air marks, the genomic masks, the genomic tests, our support with provincial health service delivery and the closeness with which we are working with the government of Papua New Guinea on addressing very difficult issues of vaccine hesitancy. I don't think we should underestimate those. That's why we're working with churches and non-government organisations, the government itself uh, in many of those Minister, places in Timor-Leste. I'm your pleased time to say for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Th thank you, Mr President. Why has the Morrison-Joyce government failed to work with our partners in Papua New Guinea to ra rally a global multilateral response to support PNG's health system? Is it because it is led by what Senator Fieravanti Wells described as the Prime Marketing Office instead of the Prime Minister's Office. Minister. It's interesting to suggest, um, I would say to the Chamber, that working with the WHO, with Gavi, with CEPI, with UNICEF, uh, with uh, humanitarian and development assistance deliverers, uh, like many of the agencies here in Australia that we support, working with uh, ISOS, with ASPEN, other organisations, uh, particularly the regional director of WHO, uh, Regional Director Keshi, who is uh, one of uh, WHO's leading administrators. I do think that is an example of the work that we are doing with uh, those sorts of international groups uh, to which uh, Senator Wong uh, has referred. As I said, I'm not the beneficiary of the um, views put by Senator Fierravanti-Wells, but based on Senator Wong's assertions, I don't agree with them. 
Senator Wong, a second supplementary? Uh, they were views put in the Parliament, Minister. You might want to acquaint yourself with them. And I again ask this, and I ask a supplementary question, which is this. Why has the government left the fate of one of our closest neighbours and most valuable partners in the hands of ministers that Senator Fieravanti Wells describes as a revolving door of L platers? Minister. Well, Senator Wong, I'm not um, not uh, not sure uh, that um, perhaps Senator Wong has the detail that would be helpful to her uh, in relation to the work that the government has Order. done with the government of Papua New Guinea, and I'm not sure it would come from the remarks of Senator Fierabadi Wells in this case. Given Order. what you have explained to me, given what you have explained to me, Senator, I think you're reflecting unfairly on Senator Fieravanti Wells, and I think that's most unfortunate, Senator Wong, that you would reflect unfairly on Senator Fieravanti Wells, because what is important here, Senator Wong, is the work that we are doing with the government of Papua Order. New Guinea, the government of Papua New Guinea, a Senator sovereign Pratt. nation with whom we are honoured to work and with whom we work very hard to address the sorts of challenges that other senators have raised sensibly and constructively in the chamber. Senator Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister advise the Senate about her recent visit to the Kimberley region of Western Australia and how NDIS services are being delivered in rural and regional Australia? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much. And firstly, con congratulate you, Mr President, on your appointment. And uh, thank you very much, Senator Smith, for the question. And thank you also for your passion and commitment for the people of the Kimberley. Um, since becoming Minister for the NDIS six months ago, I have been listening and consulting widely on all aspects of the scheme. Recently, I spent a week travelling across the Kimberley region to hear and see firsthand the impact of thin markets on how the NDIS is, supporting, is able to support people with disability in regional and remote communities. This included many meetings, such as the ones with staff and volunteers and organisers at the Yarrayungi Aboriginal Medical Service in Halls Creek, the Women's Resource Centre in Fitzroy Crossing, the Lions Outback Vision Institute uh, in Broome, and also the East Kimberley All Ability Sport and Recreation Program in Kununurra. I thank them all for their hospitality, uh, their time and also their openness. This allowed me to hear and see firsthand how the NDIS is transforming lives. However, it also allowed me to see firsthand the challenges in providing care and support in remote and regional communities. The negative impact on thin markets is very clear. The workforce shortages further exacerbate service availability. Average plan budgets in the Kimberley are actually around $10,000 higher than the national average while utilisation is 20 per cent lower at 51 per cent. And quite clearly, Mr President, this needs to change nationally. I hope to bring forward legislation this year to start addressing these problems of thin markets by providing the NDIA with more flexible commissioning models. Mr President, the level and the quality of support received by any Australian on the NDIS should never, ever be determined by where they live. But today, sadly, with thin markets, that is still the case. Senator Smith, a Thank supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Your visit to the Kimberley was indeed very, very well received and welcomed. Um, what are the challenges for the National Disability Insurance Scheme across regional and rural communities across our country? Minister. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator Smith, for that question. The NDIS fourth quarter report shows plan utilisation in the Kimberley region is 20 per cent lower than the national average, which sadly is not uncommon in, re in remote communities in particular across Australia. And that is not just the case uh, for disability services, but for the provision of all care and support services in remote communities. There are so many experiences from this trip that I will always remember. But sadly, one is where my heart literally broke meeting a quadriplegic participant in her 40s in a remote aged care facility. She knows exactly how she wants to live her life with her children. 
but sadly, living so remotely, the life she wants to live is not yet possible. She has nowhere else to live, to stay near community or get the support she needs she needs so badly and that she's actually funded from her NDIS packages. The upcoming changes Minister, to legislation Minister, will help us all address this. The time this. for the answer has expired. Senator Smith, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. What are the next steps to address the issues that you observed during your visit to the Kimberley region? Minister. Uh, thank you again, Senator Smith. To tackle the endemic issue of thin markets, we have to enable providers to operate effectively nationwide, no matter where they are delivering services. To do this, we have to build local workforces across regional and remote Australia for all Order. types of care and support services. And this is a shared responsibility with the federal <coughs> government and the state government. I'm delighted to be working with Pat Turner and the, Nas the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation to develop a model to deliver in new and different ways a wide range of care and support services in remote communities, including for NDIS participants. Together, we are developing a regional community-based workforce model informed by the needs of locals to provide long-term employment opportunities and better support for people living in remote communities and also remote towns. Minister, oh, oh, uh, Minister Burnham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mm -hmm. And that uh, ends question time for today. Um, I will just ask senators to give us a few moments while we move to taking note. Are there any motions, uh, Senator Keneally? Uh, yes, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why questions on notice numbers 236, 238, 240, 242 and 245, 255 excuse me, from the Finance and Public Administration Estimates hearings remain unanswered. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President, and, uh, and I thank Senator, uh, Senator Keneally for um, advice shortly prior to question time in relation to, uh, to these matters. Uh, Deputy President, as I informed the Senate earlier this week, there have been quite an unprecedented number of, uh, of questions uh, posed uh, through the life of this parliament, uh, both questions on notice provided uh, through the chamber as well as questions on notice uh, through estimates committees. In fact, if my recollection is correct, uh, those uh, coming through the chamber uh, running uh, close to being in excess uh, of uh, the total number handled in the two previous parliaments combined, uh, showing the many thousands of questions uh, that, uh, that have been presented. Uh, overwhelmingly, those questions uh, uh, are answered and, uh, and answered in as timely a manner uh, as possible. Uh, I'll look into uh, to the particulars in relation to the questions that, uh, that Senator Keneally uh, has highlighted. Um, and, uh, and no doubt efforts will be made to provide uh, responses to, uh, to those uh, in, uh, in as timely a way as possible. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. Madam Deputy President, uh, understanding Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Well, what will happen first in Australian politics? Will the Prime Minister hop into his com car and head down to the Governor General's to call an election? Or will he and his ministers finally answer the questions put to them here in the 46th Parliament? It's disturbing how easily those opposite ignore their duties as public servants in this place. Accountability, transparency, responsibility, all nouns without a home in the Morrison-Joyce vernacular. I don't hold a hose, mate, said the Prime Minister. Well, he doesn't hold any answers, apparently, either. He doesn't appear to do much of anything. We know that the Prime Minister failed on the two jobs he had this year, roll out the vaccine and set up fit-for-purpose quarantine. Now, today, I have picked five questions that have been ignored by this Morrison-Joyce government. Five questions. Here they are. Here they are, five questions. But they are over, there are hundreds. There are 500 questions, over 500 in fact, unanswered, dating back to March 2020. 
March 2020, pre-pandemic questions, no answers yet provided. Those unanswered questions from March 2020 were asked to the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Morrison. The Prime Minister won't an answer them, and if that's the example he's setting, then no wonder the Morrison and Joyce government acts the way that it does. A fish does rot from the head down, after all, and this rotten behaviour undermines the community's faith in our democratic institutions. There are some in our community who might think this is all business as usual. But there are an increasing number of Australians who are growing disillusioned with the way Mr. Morrison plays politics in this country. They see the bad behaviour of the Morrison-Joyce government go unpunished and think that it represents the parliament at large. My message to those people is this. This is not normal. This is not the status quo. This is how bad government operates. The Morrison-Joyce government have plumbed to new depths in every aspect of accountability and transparency. Compare this government to its most recent predecessors. I personally never thought we would pine for the days of Prime Minister Turnbull, but a comparison between then and now just shows how quickly the standards have deteriorated under Mr. Morrison. Dr. Parkinson, the former secretary for the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, put the real value in accountability and transparency. That standard was set from the very top, and it flowed down accordingly. There was an expectation that you would do your job as a minister. Now, they got it wrong under the Turnbull government, a lot, but at least on occasion people were disciplined. They were disciplined for misconduct. They were disciplined for their lack of accountability. Now, the current Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, does not punish bad behaviour, he rewards it. Look no further than the current Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience. This is an unlimited debate, Madam Deputy President, but yet I still wouldn't have enough time to go through the intricacies of the sports rort scandal. The sports rort scandal saw Minister McKenzie forced to resign but not before she was quickly brought back by Mr. Morrison. And now she is deciding Australia's climate change policy. She is one of the gang of four that's going to decide how many millions or perhaps billions of dollars of pork are going to flow through to allow Mr. Morrison to secure a deal on climate change. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Certainly we saw today the minister openly threatening her cabinet colleagues. Quite an extraordinary performance in question time. But Minister McKenzie is one of the many scandal-prone ministers who've made startling comebacks under Mr. Morrison. Ministers Taylor, Joyce, Colbeck, Cash, Lay, Dutton, Fletcher, Robert, Tudge, Hunt, Rustin, Reynolds, Porter. If you want to work out what they did, go to our website, notonyourside.com.au. If you're a backbencher in the Morrison government, if you are stuck looking at the back of someone's head in question time, you have got to be asking yourself, what have I done right to be stuck up the back here? It's truly staggering what gets rewarded on Mr. Morrison's watch. Ministerial standards, dead under Mr. Morrison, and we will see that again, I predict, when after the cabinet adopts net zero by 2050, Minister McKenzie and Minister Pitt don't have to abide by the ministerial guidelines. Let's see if they get a free pass. Comparing the days of old with the current standard is truly an exercise in despair. A stark contrast between a bygone era when ministerial standards and government accountability existed and the utter mess that we are in today. This Prime Minister doesn't like answering questions because he knows the Australian people won't like the answers. This is a Prime Minister that governs by focus group. How do we know that? Because his own colleagues, one of his own colleagues told the media that at the heart of the Morrison government sits a focus group. His own colleagues, Senator Faravanti Wells, call the Prime Minister's office the Prime Marketing Office. And so hundreds of unanswered questions on notice 
is a massive red flag to the Australian people. Let's be clear, if the answers were any good news for the government, they'd be shouting them from the rooftop. The Prime Minister can't build a chicken coop without a ribbon coating ceremony and a social media post. And that is because he is all photo op and no follow up. Now there's very little substance to what goes on in the Morrison government. There's no big grand plan. There's no ambition for the Australian people. The Morrison government, Mr. Morrison and his ministers, they're not interested in Australians' jobs. They're only interested in their own jobs. Mr. Morrison doesn't care about anything except his own political agenda. And he is certainly not on the side of the Australian people. If Mr. Morrison was, he would be up front with the Australian people. He would answer the questions put to him in this parliament. He would hold ministers account for their actions and behaviours. He'd be proud of his work rather than hiding the answers in the shadows. The Australian people have a right to know in a democracy what decisions are being made in their name and how their taxpayer dollars are being spent. The problem for Mr Morrison is on the rare occasion that he and his ministers do answer questions, the Australian people don't seem to like their answers. And so they know that being truthful to the Australian people will jeopardise their own job security. And there's an election right around the corner. Do we seriously think these 500 questions that haven't been noticed are somehow 500 good news stories kicking around the ministerial wing? They're going to roll out in the advent of an election? Of course not. That's absurd. These are questions they don't want to answer before an election because they don't want the truth to come out. So the Australian people have a right to know how their government's being run. Scrutiny of the Morrison-Joyce government is essential. It's essential for our democracy. It's essential for restoring the public's faith in democratic institutions. Because on this government's watch, we have had sports rorts. We have had robo-debt. We have had the ruby princess. We've had safer seats rorts, the Leppington Triangle, car park rorts, jobs for mates, Paladin, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation grant, hello world, job keeper rorts, where they gave $13 billion of taxpayer money to companies that turned a profit during the pandemic and they're not lifting a finger to try to get any of that money back. Under robo-debt, the pursuit of the penniless in robo-debt, some of them to their deaths, but to their corporate mates, don't lift a finger. Don't even suggest they might want to pay the money back. $13 billion wasted. A trillion dollars of debt run up and so little to show for it. Of course, what did we see last week? The Building Better Regions rorts. What a joke. What a joke. The money overwhelmingly going, 90% I think it was, to government held or marginal seats. Of course, Let's not forget, as Senator Green points out, some of it went to areas that are, could only, in the wildest of expectations or imaginations, be considered regions. I think in New South Wales, my personal favourite being the regional funding that went to refurbish the North Sydney swimming pool. <laughs> right there, under the Harbour Bridge, next door to Luna Park, directly opposite the Opera House, a regional fund to build a swimming pool. I don't know, maybe they think people from the regions in New South Wales like to travel all the way into North Sydney to have a swim. Anyway, we know billions and billions and billions of dollars of rorting, scandal, waste, mismanagement under this government's watch. It seems every time before they, every time they appear before Senate estimates, what do we get? Another color-coded spreadsheet. What did we hear last week? And, and um, Webster, the member from Mali, in the other place, she just basically belled the cat. She inadvertently let it out of the bag. 
There was a green spreadsheet and a pink spreadsheet, but only government members got told about the green and the pink spreadsheets. If you wanted your, law, your project to, get, uh, to move from the pink to the green, you had to lobby really hard some government minister. Well, no wonder about 90% of the funding went to government or marginal seats because they were running a color-coded spreadsheet scheme. These, this is why the Morrison government ministers and the prime minister himself are not answering questions put to them through the finance committee. I can't imagine how bad this is all going to look when the ANAO in inevitably reports and all the dodgy pork barreling that's going to happen to get to a deal on net zero emissions by 2050. What was it? One, one of the government members called it a giant green rainbow that's going to spread across the regions with crocs of pork sprinkled about. And we've got a minister here in the chamber, the Minister for Finance, who won't even tell us how much money they're prepared to spend for this political fix, who won't even tell us if it's in the budget. That trillion dollars of debt, nothing to show for it, going up and up. Just a political outcome. But this is an inevitable outcome when you have a prime minister who views every act of governance as a, a marketing opportunity. There's nothing that can't be solved with a catchy slogan. No storm that can't be weathered. I mean, look what we saw in the chamber here today. The Morrison-Joyce government sought to politicize domestic violence victims. Here I strike a deal with the Minister Alex Hawke. After two years, two years I've been trying to get a meeting with the Minister for Immigration. Finally I get one. Finally we get a deal. We get an agreement. We're going to deliver this piece of legislation. We're going to fix some things for women and children who are, are suffering from domestic violence. We're going we're to deal with the problem of low-level offending. We're going to try to address the concerns raised by New Zealand. We strike a deal. We're going to come to a conclusion in two weeks' time. What happens? Mr. Morrison pulls the rug out underneath his own minister because what would he rather have? A political outcome, not a practical solution. And what a low act. Women and children who are victims of domestic violence? Is there anything this prime minister won't politicize? The Morrison-Joyce government does not, as the prime minister once said, burn for Australia. They simmer in self-interest. The Australian people are waking up to the Prime Minister's shtick, his ad man approach, his prime marketing office. And there's something to see here with these unanswered questions. There must be, because they wouldn't be so intent on hiding the answers if there wasn't. Being the Prime Minister of Australia actually requires leadership. It means making the tough decisions, being held to account. It means bringing people with you and holding them to a standard. So. The malaise that swept through the cabinet is a choice made by this prime minister because it's the easy way out. And it's the Australian people who are worse off. As a result, this prime minister won't hold himself or his ministers accountable. I hope the ministers and secretaries listening today do take notice and take time to prepare thoroughly for Senate estimates next week. We can expect questions to be answered when they're taken on notice. So we're hoping for a lot more cooperation in the room next week. Thank you, Senator Keneally. And I believe you wish to speak on the same matter, Senator Patrick. Yes, oh. I do. Yeah. So I rise to also take note of the Minister's answer uh, to Senator Keneally. There's a great difficulty uh, taking place in the chamber in that uh, we are asking questions, as we do as part of our oversight role. It's an important role of the Senate to ask questions, to inform itself as to the conduct of government such that we can do our job properly, we can discharge our responsibilities properly in the oversight of government. Yes, questions are asked and there's a time requirement placed in the standing orders or in the case of uh, estimates, uh, time requirements placed by the committees themselves for the return of those answers. And it is disrespectful for ministers not to supply those answers within the, the, uh, the recognised timeframes. It's disrespectful not just to the senators who ask those questions, but to the people who those senators represent. I ask many questions uh, on the basis of an email I receive in my uh, 
in my electoral office uh, from a constituent that just wants to know something. And so I'll happily put a question on notice if uh, a South Australian asks me a question and I don't know the answer. It's an important process. Now, of course, we could stop questions on notice if indeed the government found some other source of money to pay for the things that it, do, that it does. But, but you know what? It gets its money from taxpayers. It gets its money from the citizens of Australia, from the businesses of Australia. And until such time as you find some alternate source, uh, I'm sure senators will continue to ask questions. Now, um, Minister Birmingham uh, stated uh, in, uh, on Monday and again today that the, the number of questions that are being asked, asked and answered in, in, this, uh, in this parliament uh, are significantly more than in the last two parliaments. In fact, I think he said that the uh, number of questions answered this parliament equals the same as the last two parliaments combined. Well, let me, let me just talk about that. There is a fundamental difference between a response to a question and an answer to a question. I can uh, give one example in relation to National Cabinet, uh, in which I, and sorry, no, it wasn't in relation to National Cabinet, it was in relation, in relation to the cost of some proceedings um, that f concluded over a year ago. And I've had to ask three times, three times for an answer. So maybe that explains the reason why there are more questions uh, uh, to this government, uh, because they simply don't answer the question, they respond to it. And that means I have to go back and now ask a second question. And sometimes I have to ask it again. So please, Minister, do not stand up in this chamber and suggest that, uh, that there's something untoward going on here, uh, on this side, in terms of how many questions we're answering, because on your side, you're simply not answering the questions properly. You're responding, but you are not answering. And when you start lifting your game, maybe these problems will disappear for you. Uh, maybe, Minister, you can go back uh, to the party room, to the, to, the, uh, to the Cabinet, and suggest to them that they take the obligation of properly answering questions uh, seriously. Now, I was at a, uh, I was at a Senate inquiry uh, last Friday in relation to submarines. And I asked uh, Admiral Mead, the head of the task force that informed the government before it made its uh, decision on the, or announcement on the 16th of September to go down a, a different pathway to what they were going before, I asked a simple question about how, um, about the advice that had been given to government about Simple things like cost and schedule. One would think that if you're cancelling one program and moving to another program, that in actual fact you would only do so on the, uh, uh, if you had at least some fundamental advice as to the cost and as to the schedule. I would ask the question about advice that was given to government, and the answer I got was an answer to a different question. I had to ask it several times. Not only did I have to ask it several times, I then had to remind the Admiral that he wears a naval uniform and he serves the Australian public and not political masters. And the culture that we're seeing across uh, when, we, when we carry out estimates um, is getting worse. We're getting officials turn up refusing to answer questions, pretending they're answering when they're only responding. And we have to go uh, again and again and again to get the answer. I know that the, the Select Committee uh, on COVID has sought answers in relation to National Cabinet uh, information, and despite a ruling by Justice White that National Cabinet is not a, a committee of the Federal Cabinet, the, the committee is still not getting answers back. And that's disgraceful. That's a judicial officer that's made a ruling that's being ignored by the government. So, uh, you know, the Senate needs to, to sort of observe what's happening here. Answers coming back that are only re that aren't answers, they're responses. Going to, going to estimates and not getting proper answers from, uh, from officials. All of that is led from a culture at the top which is about secrecy. 
We can see that in the uh, COAG um, uh, amendment legislation where uh, the Prime Minister, having lost uh, the, uh, his, his battle in, or his, the battle between me and him in the, in the AAT, is now seeking to introduce a new secrecy law, obsessed with secrecy. Just answer the questions. Just be open and honest. In actual fact, on, uh, I pressed the Admiral. I pressed the Admiral. I actually had to say to him, you are running very close to being in contempt of the Senate, before he finally answered. And the answer he gave me was quite reasonable. But why do we have this culture in there of let's not answer questions? We've got two matters before the Privileges Committee now. The first being uh, the government's refusal to provide documents to the Economics Committee relating to naval shipbuilding, to, relating to one of the biggest uh, government expenditures, expenditures ever. And the documents that were requested were not confidential, uh, they're not, not secret, they weren't top secret. They were simply documents provided uh, to the government in order to help make a decision about which ship builder was going to get the, was going to get the job. Uh, these are documents that go to what these uh, shipbuilders promised Australian industry. And the government has uh, refused to pr provide uh, answers um, or, in fact, those documents to uh, the committee that's gone off to privileges. And there is some progress being made uh, in relation to that. But how do we get to this point? How do we get to this point where even documents being given to a committee who are willing to accept them in camera such that they are protected by criminal sanction in the event of a, 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 of, a, of a leak. How do we get to this situation where the executive says, we're not going to provide those documents to the Senate? Then we have uh, a statutory official who receives a lawful order from the Senate. The Senate makes an order for production. And of course, it, the Senate's always very reasonable in the way it conducts its business, much like a court who might issue a subpoena, gives the, the uh, person subject to the order or subject to the subpoena the opportunity to step forward and say, I don't think I should respond to the subpoena for these reasons. I don't think I should respond to the order for production for these reasons. And then what uh, happens is, uh, in the case of an OPD, the Senate considers that, that, that response and makes its final decision. And that's exactly what happened in relation to the Tax Commissioner. Uh, the Senate made a decision that the balance of the public interest lied in disclosure. It disagreed with, the, with the, where the balance lied in terms, of, uh, in terms of public interest and made a lawful order. And anyone who thinks that uh, I'm making this stuff up, go and read the 1998 High Court case of Egan and Willis. And I know Senator Keneally knows that because it relates to um, uh, um, Mr Egan um, in, in, the, uh, in the New South Wales Parliament. The, uh, the High Court affirmed what was always known through section 49 of the Constitution that, this, this, uh, that Houses of Parliament have the ability to acquire or require the production of documents from the execu executive in order for it to be able to discharge its functions. So we're now in a situation where we have a, um, uh, where we have a couple of matters on foot with the Privileges Committee. Now, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is a Senate mojo moment. I look at how the US Senate conducts its inquiries and I see uh, officials that turn up to, to the US Senate, they dare not answer a question. They dare not provide a document which the, the, the US Senate orders because they know that the US Senate will act. And in some sense, there's a test uh, running in the background right now for the Australian Senate. We can push ourselves back into a position where we are treated with the absolute respect that the US Senate is treated in the US, or we can fail to deal with what I say as a question of fact um, is a contempt. The delay of, a, of the Naval Shipbuilding uh, um, Committee um, uh, proceedings for well over a year. That can't go unaddressed. And I hope, uh, I hope the Privileges Committee finds that to be a contempt and issues a fine and, you know, or, or applies a sanction. We have to change the culture. So uh, whilst I allege, uh, or no, no, just assert, 
that there is a culture of secrecy uh, in the Morrison government, driven from the very, very top. Driven from the very, very top. In some sense, the Senate, when it uh, seeks, seeks uh, uh, answers and doesn't get them, uh, basically lets the, the executive get away with it and becomes part of the problem. So I'm hopeful that we will see a change. Some Senate mojo. You know, I refer back to uh, uh, you know, uh, Facebook a couple of years ago with the, the, the UK House of Commons. They wanted access to documents from Mr Zuckerberg. Uh, he refused. Of course, he's outside jurisdiction. Someone turns up to the UK and uh, the House of Commons says, well, we've got someone who's got the documents. And they sent out the sergeant at arms Met, met up with the gentleman, invited him to come back in a very uh, insistent way to the House of Commons and offered him two choices, hand over the documents or you can, you can sit in the jail for, uh, for, uh, for a while. And the UK House of Commons got those documents because it stood up, because it exercised its powers. You don't have to do it many, many times. It's a little bit, a little bit like uh, freedom of navigation exercises. Every once in a while you have to sail a ship through international waters despite a country saying that they think it's their waters in order to be able to assert a right, to, 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 to uh, remind people of, of, of the rights. And I hope the Senate stands up in these two instances with these two uh, um, privileges matters to send a very strong message to uh, the executive that they must respect uh, the, our need to be well informed in what, what it is that we do, uh, our need to be able to get access to documents when we, when we, when we ask for them. Okay, so uh, what we're seeing today, the issue raised by Senator Keneally, uh, is in fact part of a much broader problem. And uh, I'd ask the Minister to consider all of the things that I've said in, in relation to that today. Uh, understand the, the responsibilities of answering questions on time. It is really important and again it's disrespectful when you don't do that. Uh, I'll foreshadow to, uh, uh, to um, the Minister that tomorrow I will also use the same standing orders in relation to the, I think it's four um, estimates questions that have been delayed or haven't been returned uh, that, that I have asked. So uh, consider that notice under the guidelines in respect of the standing order and hopefully by tomorrow I will have all those answers. Otherwise we'll be, we'll be back here having another conversation about the responsibilities of government and the need for them to be able to respond to, uh, to um, the Senate in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Were you seeking the call, Senator no, Gallagher? Okay, so the, uh, so the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why 2020 2021 additional estimates questions on notice numbers 1356 501 and 519 to 531 inclusive placed on the notice through the Finance and Public Administration Committee in the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio remain unanswered. Sorry, Caitlin, sorry. Minister. Oh. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for her question. Um, uh, Deputy President, uh, as, uh, as I indicated in response to Senator Keneally and have already indicated this week um, and on previous occasions, the government has been dealing with quite unprecedented numbers of questions posed through the parliament. Uh, and in doing so, the government's been providing quite unprecedented numbers of answers uh, to, uh, to questions posed through the parliament. We're not talking about hundreds of questions. We're not talking about thousands of questions. We're actually talking about tens of thousands of questions in the life of this parliament. Uh, and the government works uh, to try to provide answers uh, where we can uh, to those questions. I know there are um, some senators uh, who um, seek to be quite diligent and earnest in, uh, in the approach that they take most of the time. And, uh, I acknowledge in, uh, in Senator Patrick's remarks that he just made, he stuck broadly uh, to 
question before the chair around uh, around accountability, around uh, around government responsiveness, uh, and he addressed issues in terms of the you know, particular nature of particular answers that uh, that are given. And uh, and so, although I don't accept the premise of all statements that Senator Patrick made in that regard, I acknowledge he uh, he at least stuck to the broad thrust of the debate. Uh, I think if uh, if the chamber reflects upon uh, the remarks made uh, by Senator Keneally immediately preceding Senator Patrick, uh, you'd find that it was a much more politicised uh, contribution, a politicised contribution uh, reflecting the fact that, uh, that um, many times, um, particularly from uh, those opposite, uh, the questions asked are, uh, are more about uh, cheap point scoring, uh, they're more about trying to advance political agendas, uh, they um, more about where you can try to seize a, a cheap headline or the like. Now, it's the right of those senators to spend their time asking those questions. And again, of the many thousands of such questions that come about, uh, the government responds to them, even where there's a whole swathe of hypocrisy attached to them. I mean, Senator Keneally, uh, you know, in her uh, uh, remarks that jumped across many issues beyond uh, beyond the questions that she was asking about, spent some time talking about uh, grant programs and, uh, and recent comments in relation to grant programs. You know, I note that, uh, that one of those grant programs, subject of uh, such commentary by Senator Keneally and others, is the Community Developments Grants Program and the Stronger Communities Program. And I, uh, you know, I can't help but notice that, uh, that uh, so many members of the opposition quite happily take advantage of such programs, promote such programs, advocate for grants under such programs. Uh, but then, of course, if there's a cheap headline to be had, uh, well, they're lining up, they're forming the conga line to, uh, uh, to be able to try to go after the cheap headline um, in, uh, in the national political debate while trying to seek out the good headline in their local media or their social media. And the Leader of the Opposition himself, the Leader of the Opposition himself, uh, with, uh, with a fabulous uh, social media post, grants for Grandler. Could your community organisation use a grant, he, uh, he says. And we've got not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but half a dozen different photos of Mr Albanese um, posing with, uh, with different grant recipients, just in, uh, just in the one post there, um, uh, happily. Happily showing, and of course, uh, you know, sort of much of that commentary from Senator Keneally, from others in this debate, has been about whether too many of these grants have been going uh, to apparently city electorates rather than regional electorates. Well, if I'm correct, I think oh, the electorate of Grangler is. Sorry, uh, uh, Senator Birmingham. I think Senator Patrick's on his feet. Senator Patrick. Just, just on a point of order, I note that the minister has wandered off the question that has been asked by uh, by. Um, uh, Senator, Senator Gallagher, and uh, is actually referring to debate that took place in relation to a previous question. Um, this part of the uh, standing orders is taking note, so um, it's a wide-ranging debate. It's taking note of unanswered questions, and I don't, I don't have the the unanswered questions, so I'm uh, not really in a position. But it's no, he's not answering a question; he's responding. Senator Patrick. I was just moved by his statement that it's a good idea to stick to the topic of the question. <laughs> Thanks, Senator Patrick. I'm sure the minister was listening to your words. Minister, please continue. Uh, touché, Senator Patrick. Touché. Um, and uh, and uh, Deputy President, in, indeed. Um, uh, I, uh, I am uh, responding a little lengthier than I did to Senator Keneally's uh, question to me about unanswered questions. Um, because of the, uh, the way in which Senator Keneally sought to then uh, address and, uh, and elaborate more broadly in relation to, uh, to those matters. I don't wish to detain the time of the Senate uh, at length. I was uh, simply making the point around the highly politicised nature of some questions. In other cases, uh, in other cases uh, we have seen, uh, particularly this year, that, uh, that questions um, you know, often are in pursuit of sensitive matters, sometimes legally sensitive matters. Uh, that, uh, that do pose extra challenges in relation uh, to responding or answering to them, and, uh, and that that requires either extra advice being taken by government in response, uh, extra care, or indeed sometimes uh, highlighting the fact that, uh, that such details are difficult uh, to provide without compromising or prejudice, prejudicing, uh, prejudicing um, legal proceedings. Uh, so, Deputy President, uh, look, I, uh, I again come back to the substantive point that I made, which is uh, that. This government in this parliament uh, has responded 
uh, to more questions uh, than, uh, than uh, were posed in the previous parliament or were posed in the parliament before that. Uh, we have been uh, more responsive than, uh, than uh, any previous government has been asked to be. Uh, we continue to seek to be so. We, uh, we have been handling uh, literally tens of thousands, some close to 35,000 questions uh, posed through different uh, estimates or parliamentary chamber processes, I should say Senate chamber processes. That doesn't count House of Representatives questions. It doesn't count uh, Senate Select Committee or Senate Standing Committee or House of Rep Representatives Standing Committee or Joint Standing Committee or Joint Select Committee questions. They're all on top of the 35,000 uh, that, uh, that we have, uh, have um, sought to handle to date um, and, uh, and indeed will continue to do so and provide responses in as timely a manner as possible, but, uh, but it is uh, in the face of uh, uh, record. Uh, record levels of questioning um, and, uh, and indeed, in some cases, uh, highly sensitive approaches to. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Well, if you listen uh, to the Minister for Finance, um, I think essentially the argument about why the questions that I have asked for, which are I think 166 days overdue now is because um, the government's had a lot of questions asked of it, more, more questions than, that, than previous governments. Well, I would submit that some of the explanation for that is because we've never had a government that's been so intent on not answering questions. I mean, many of these questions that I've asked that have been on notice now for 166 days or 166 days late, could have been answered in the Estimates Committee. Uh, but they weren't, because this government's approach to transparency and accountability is to have public servants appear and on anything that is not in the government's interest to answer, they will take it on notice or, or find another way not to answer the question. And that is a problem with, with the openness of this government which has now got a consequential effect on the number of questions that are being taken on notice, which now the senator leaving the chamber is used as an excuse to say we're overworked. Well, it's only right that the Senate should get not only a reasonable explanation other than, sorry, we came to work and are really busy and we haven't got round to it, which was essentially Senator Birmingham's um, submission to the Senate, to demand that this information be provided. You are the government, you are responsible and the guardians of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in public funds. You are making decisions on the nation's behalf. There are senators in this place elected to hold you to account. You answer those questions. You don't come in here and, and cry fake tears to say you're a bit busy and you haven't got round to it completely useless explanation. And the Prime Minister and Cabinet, who these questions are late from, is the worst offender in my experience. Led by the Prime Minister's right-hand man, the butler that runs when the bell gets, that gets rung by the Prime Minister to serve his every need, leads that department and that is the standard they set where they take things on notice and then have no intention of answering to the Senate. So force us to come in here and expose them and embarrass them, and I still don't think it will matter to Mr Gaitchens or his crew, because that is the leadership under this Prime Minister that has shown about accountability, honesty transparency, responsibilities to the parliament, accountability to the parliament, not just to executive government. And when it's led like that and PM and C behave this way, why should any other department be any better? You know, Because it's clear they get rewarded and we're heading into estimates next week. Let's see how many senior public servants paid hundreds of thousands of dollars turn up and don't have information available or aren't able to take that question right now, we will get back to you, knowing full well 
that they can take 100 days or, or longer because there is no consequence, because they're rewarded by the leadership for doing that. That's, that's, what will, that's my prediction of what will happen and that's why we're here now, using up precious um, time in the Senate to make the point that this is unacceptable. That's why you just had that contribution from Senator Keneally and Senator Patrick, and I associate myself with the comments Senator Patrick made as well, because it's spot on. And I think what this government hopes is that this explanation, oh shucks, we, we got to work and we're a little bit busy, is enough to just keep it at bay until the election. I mean, you can see what's going on. But the longer and the bigger picture after eight years of this type of approach is that these institutions, these conventions, the, the, the parliamentary um, practice that has developed over time and enshrined these processes as part of our democracy are getting chipped away at. And it's important that we stand up for them and important that we call it out, even if Mr Gaitchens isn't going to answer my letter that I wrote to him asking him where these answers are, even if they come to estimates next week and refuse to answer, it is important that the Senate stand up, calls it out and tries to protect it. Because when you whittle away the public service, as has been done under this government, and you start whittling away the FOI Act, as has been attempted by this government and continues to attempt to do it, and when you disempower the Auditor General, as this government has done in, in punishment and retaliation for the audit reports that it puts out on their rorting grant schemes, when you start wearing away the integrity processes of the parliament, there will be consequences on our democracy and on our access to information. And that is what we are standing up for. And that is what is happening here. It may not seem a lot that my questions 1356, 501 and 519 to 531 asked at March estimates 2021. You know, it might not seem much, but the fact that this is a systemic approach to dealing with questions on notice is about whittling away those parliamentary practices, the scrutiny role of the Senate, because it suits this government. It's exactly what it's doing. They've done it to the Auditor General, they're doing it to the FOI Act, they're doing it to the way they, they deal with OPDs in this place. I mean, you know, it's all pretty obvious. And maybe on its own, on their, on their own, like people don't see that it's that big a deal, but put it all together and there has been an eight year long assault on the scrutiny and accountability functions of the parliament. And that's why we are raising these points today. You know, so it's not about an overworked government. It's about a secret government. It's a government that will do anything it can to keep information away from the public eye, regardless of the fact that it's paid for with public dollars. And if it's not in their political interests, they will withhold access to that information. And that's why we are raising these points today. And the issues, I've, the, issues, the, the issues that are covered by my questions actually relate to a lot of questions around the matters surrounding Ms Brittany Higgins and the role of the Prime Minister's office. Um, there is a whole range of questions now that, it, that, that didn't suit the Prime Minister to ask at the time and it doesn't suit him to answer now. But it's, you know, and the option available to the department is to provide an answer, including we are not in a position to provide this answer because, for example, there is a police investigation ongoing, something like that. They could do that, but they don't bother doing that either. It's just a blanket refusal uh, to, to um, respond to reasonable questions asked of officials. Now, it suits the government to have this approach, I have no doubt about it.
But we must stand up and we must ask for reasonable explanations and we must demand that officials attend estimates with the answers to these questions. 166 days overdue. And I would hope, when you guys are on the opposition benches, that you would seek to protect these conventions too, but that you wouldn't have to fight so hard because it would be working under a different arrangement with a government that actually understood and respected these practices. So I don't accept Senator Birmingham's explanation in any way that this is just because they've got a lot of questions. They've got a lot of questions because they don't answer the answers when they, the questions when they show up, when they're required to show up, and they don't provide information they should be, provide without having to take it on notice. For example, the Doherty modelling that we spoke of yesterday. Why hasn't that been released? Why do you have to put in an FOI request and questions on no without notice and questions on notice about accessing that information? Well, there's a little saving for the the uh, count of questions on notice for Senator Birmingham. You could cut them down right now if you actually started releasing the information that you should release in the public interest. And you should answer the questions that have been asked. And senators should be treated with res respect and senators should be able to fulfil their responsibilities for their roles in this parliament, including holding this government to account. That's what this is about. Anyway, to Mr Gaitchens, I hope I do get a response uh, from the letter that I wrote, and I am looking forward to receiving all of those answers to questions on notice that are now 166 days overdue before estimates uh, meets on Monday. Uh, there is no reasonable explanation that I will accept about why these questions have not been answered and why they should not be answered uh, in time by close of business tomorrow afternoon. Um, it is, other, you are just willfully obstructing the work of the Senate if, 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 you, if these are not answered. You've had plenty of a, um, notice. You were reminded of the obligations in a letter. You were reminded again today, as per the guidance around this standing order, that we are interested in these, the answers to these questions, and I look forward to receiving them uh, by the end of this week. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Mackenzie and Senator Rushton to the questions asked by Senators Keneally, Gallagher and Wong. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And what is clear from the answers to questions today from Senator McKenzie, and indeed throughout this week, is at the heart of this faux negotiation between the Nationals and the Liberals, the will they, won't they, at the heart of that is actually the very existence of the National Party. Because there's only two reasons the National Party actually exists these days. One is for pork barrelling and the other is for culture wars. And Senator Mackenzie has brazenly confirmed that today and this week with her answers in question time. They're stringing things along in an attempt to extort as much pork as they can out of the Liberal Party. They've even appointed a four-person committee to actually look at how much pork they can get and what they can actually do with it. That is actually what the National Party are up to this week. That is why they are stringing things along in this phone negotiation. And exhibit A in this is actually Senator Mackenzie herself, the person who lost her job over pork barrelling. Now brought back into the ministry, it's only the nationals that could actually be capable of doing something because they don't punish someone who's been engaged in pork barrelling. They actually reward them and get them back in cabinet and then actually put them at the heart of what they are up to this week. So it says all about the National Party that that is actually what they are trying to do this week. They're trying to extort as much as they can out of the libs and then actually go about pork barrelling in the lead up to an election. And the second reason why the nationals exist these days is the culture wars. That's all they've got to offer the people of regional Australia. Not actually a vision for the future, not actually setting out something they want to achieve. All they want to do is engage in the culture war. 
Uh, they never attempt to have a positive vision for regional Australia. It's all about the scare campaign. And we can see elements about that. We can see the way that Senator Kenavan's behaving. They want to ensure that they've still got that ability. And again, Senator McKenzie let the cat out of the bag. The only, she said this in answer to a question yesterday. The only reason they exist is to try and stop Labor from being in government. No actual positive vision, no actual reason for being in government. The only reason they exist is because they want to try and stop Labor from being in government. That is as sad as the National Party have become in this place. And the frustrating thing for this, and I spend a lot of time in regional Queensland. Uh, I've got a second office in Gladstone. I spend a lot of time in Gladstone, the seat of Flynn. I do a lot of travel through central Queensland. And that is what is so frustrating. That is why we are so frustrated by this motivation that we see from the National Party, is that there's so many opportunities that are out there in regional Queensland, be it jobs, be it the future. And there's businesses that are actually going about taking those opportunities, but through no help from the federal government. They're actually spending their own money because they see opportunity and they want to do the right thing by the planet in the long term. So they're actually investing their own money in these opportunities. I was in Emerald a couple of months ago with the shadow treasurer, uh, and we visited the bus company in Emerald that does a lot of charter work. They do significant amounts of work for the mining industry, uh, taking in workers, taking out workers so they can do it safely so the workers aren't driving tired after a shift. They are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars converting their bus fleet to hydrogen. No help from the government whatsoever. This is a bus company, a business group that want to do the right thing by the country. They see opportunity. They're prepared to spend their hard-earned money transitioning their fleet because it's the right thing to do in Emerald in the seat of Flynn. We saw what the state government did with Forest Future Industries just a couple of Sundays ago. A really exciting announcement in Gladstone about hydrogen. Uh, hundreds of jobs at stake there. I, I, was in a, I was in Gladstone a few days after that announcement and I actually got the sense that the people of Gladstone saw this as a real initiative. They know this is going to deliver jobs. They know it's going to have a beneficial impact for their local community. This is what the future looks like. But again, without any help from the federal government, the state government have had to go it alone. And also, the week before that in Gladstone, we saw the joint announcement from Rio Tinto and also the state government about the future of their refineries in Gladstone as well, and looking at clean energy that is actually going to power those refineries into the future. And those refineries use about 20 per cent of Queensland's electricity. They're significant energy users, but it shows you again that they're looking at what the future looks like for them and understand the role that clean energy will play. So it is so frustration that while the nationals uh, have this faux yeah. war, regional Queensland and other parts of the country are getting on with the job of transitioning the country. If only we had a federal government that was actually prepared to work with them, how much more could we achieve? Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Hughes. Oh, Hasn't oh, switched okay. well, someone, oh, look, someone needed to let me know. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I thank the Labor Party for raising this very important issue. Because what I have just heard, what has just been highlighted to this chamber, is that our tactics are working. We are on a path to lowering emissions through technology, not taxes. Private enterprise is working with government to achieve a lower emissions future. It is exactly what this side of the chamber has been saying for the last couple of years. I mean, everyone wants to focus on the fact we haven't got a carbon tax. Therefore, without a carbon tax, we're not addressing Net zero. We're not addressing carbon emissions without a carbon tax. Well, what a crock. What an absolute load of rubbish, which has just been proven by the Senator's contribution across the chamber. Because, yes, through our roadmap to a lower emissions future, through our technology, not taxes, policies, Private enterprise is getting on with the job, as are our government agencies. Australia has reduced its emissions by 20 per cent since 2005, the majority of which has, been, has occurred since we took government in 2013. That is only 1 per cent less 
than what has been achieved by the EU. But we've done it through technology, not taxes. We have done it by expanding consumer choice, not restricting it, by partnering with the private sector, not hitting them with a big stick, by consolidating our advantage, by seeing Australia adopt rooftop solar panels at a rate higher than anywhere else on the planet. That is, that is because we have not taxed people out of the market. We have not made it impossible. And what I hear from the ground, what I hear from the ground, is that even from people who absolutely believe in climate change, people who absolutely support moving towards a low emissions future, but what they are scared of is they're scared for their future. I've heard from farmers who acknowledge climate change, who live with climate change, who live through drought, they live through flood, they deal with the threat of bushfires year in, year out. But what they don't want to see is them locked off their farms for some arbitrary native vegetation target that does not achieve as good a carbon emission, a carbon abatement as other alternatives. But that's what we saw the last time the Labor Party was in power. We saw farmers lose their right to farm. They ignored the potential for soil carbon capture and storage through cropping enterprises. They ignored the potential to reduce methane emissions from livestock by changing dietary uh, requirements. Since we've been in power, the CSIRO, working with James Cook University, have developed fantastic uh, seaweed-based feedstock for the livestock in industry that are achi achieving huge emissions reductions, phenomenal emissions reductions. And these people should be rewarded, not lambasted, because they haven't implemented a tax. I've heard from miners worried about the threat that we're just going to shut the industry overnight, which is also a crock. Croc. Out of all the countries that have signed up to net zero, some of the, there's 129 new coal-fired power stations currently under construction by countries that have signed up to net zero. And guess whose coal they want? They want ours because our coal burns cleaner and more efficiently. So I'm not shutting the coal industry and I won't support any moves that do. And I back the mining industry because that's where we get our lithium from, for the batteries that underpin our renewable energy. So thank you, Labor. Thank you for highlighting all the progress that we as a nation have made. And I wish that we would all get behind the achievements that both private enterprise and government agencies have made to get us to 20 per cent reductions, you, to get Time us on the pathway expired. to Paris. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, this week's certainly uh, been an interesting one, to say the least. And, um, you know, on one hand, we have uh, the coalition, in particular members of the National Party, say that they have a plan, they have a plan to reduce emissions, but on the other hand, uh, still want to um, support some of the biggest polluters in this country. Uh, indeed, as parliamentarians, it is a reasonable statement to make that we are by no means strangers to conflict, particularly in this place here in the Senate. But today in question time, it's been a prominent illustration of this, of where our passion, our disagreements with each other on what is best for our nation's future are on full display for all to see. However, it's quite uncommon though, and having been only here for two years, but my time previously in another capacity, it is very uncommon for us to publicly see such great levels of division between members of the government itself. The opposition and the government, sure, public division between ministers and backbenchers, between the Prime Minister and his own Deputy Prime Minister? Not a common occurrence indeed. And yet, this is what has been on show to the Australian public, right in the middle of a global pandemic, right in the middle of when our economy is only just starting to recover. 
In fact, division between the two coalition parties is what has been on display for quite some time now. For those sitting on the other side of this chamber, we have been fortunate to have front row seats, so to speak, to the great climate stoush between the Liberals and the Nationals, to see firsthand and live in colour the continual frame of the already delicate coalition agreement. And what a debacle it has been. The quiet little meetings becoming public press conferences in the hallway. The private sledging spilling out onto our television screens. And one could be forgiven for thinking that this stoush was some kind of valiant defence by the junior coalition partner of a policy position that was at the heart of the concerns of their own constituency. Regrettably, it is not. What it is, in reality, is the resistance of a few against not just the tide of history, but by the wishes of their own supporters. Whilst those nationals opposite would wish to have you believe that they are standing up for the battling farmer in refusing to come out, to, sorry, to come to the table on climate policy. In reality, this is not what is happening. This is not what is happening on the ground. What is happening here is the nationals are again proving themselves to be an, an island on this issue. Cast adrift, all on their own, with barely a stakeholder to keep them company. Now take, for instance, the National Farmers Federation, who themselves have already committed to a net carbon zero by 2050. Take, for instance, the grain growers, who themselves have endorsed the National Farmers Federation's own plans and are committed to developing a grain-specific target for 2030. Not 2050, but 2030. Take, for instance, the red meat industry, which I love and support wholeheartedly. But they themselves have set a target of carbon neutrality by 2030. So exactly who is that the Nationals are purporting to stand up for? And at what exactly is the cost of their resistance? Well, I know that there are many farmers, many farmers that I have met, who are lamenting the fact that those opposite are failing to take the issue seriously, failing to accept the challenge and invest in their future prosperity. Farmers are disproportionately affected by climate change. They will gain directly from reducing emissions. They'll be better off through increases in productivity, whatever the global effort does to limit further warming. So where is the plan from the nationals? Australia's farmers want more climate action. They want to be part of the solution. It is no wonder why regional Australians are wary of the nationals refusing to provide our agricultural producers and the regions with the tools they need to prosper in the years to come is not a plan. It, they are failing Thank in their you, own Senator leadership. Thank you, Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I am relieved to hear Senator Tacconi express his uh, support for the red meat industry, and I look forward to not only having a steak with him soon, but also perhaps enjoying some of that Grains Council barley used to produce some pretty cracking beers as well. But I do welcome the uh, end, hopefully, of the ALP targeting the cattle industry with their ridiculous notions around methane emissions from cows. Uh, the Morrison government absolutely understands that Australians are looking to reduce emissions into the future. They're looking for a future that is clean air and clean water and a great environment for their children, their children's children and even their children's children grandchildren. But we do, however, understand the pressures that everyday Australians and their families face. And we stand here looking to technology, not taxes, because the reason we want to look to technology is that we will never support the imposition of a carbon tax on family. We will not support the imposition of an ETS or whichever ac an ac acronym you guys want to, on the other side, want to dress it up as. Heaven forbid the government benches are ever graced by those opposite again, because we know the first thing we will see is an effort to tax 
those everyday Australians. But what we do also understand on this side of the chamber is that net zero by 2050 does not mean zero emissions. Now, I know the far end of this chamber, they have a little bit of an inability to decipher that fact, but we know that families rely on energy to keep their homes and their businesses running and have certainty that when they need the power, they can turn it on, but that this security is not achieved through taxing them and by pandering to some left-wing anti-coal and gas agenda. What's also important to note as Australians is that 40 per cent of our emissions are actually the result of our export products. They're actually the result of how this country engages with the world. And in fact, the only two countries that have similar economies to us in this matter are New Zealand and Canada. And when it comes to reducing emissions, we are streets ahead of both of those countries. And we have done this through adopting a suite of technology products and continuing to support the market and businesses to invest in this technology to drive emissions lower without imposing additional tax burdens on families, small businesses and everyday Australians. So hydrogen is one of the things that this government is incredibly enthusiastic about seeing the sector grow. We've only recently opened up a new round of grants for seven potential hydrogen hubs, one of them in the Hunter region, an area that I get to spend a great deal of time in. And I am absolutely thrilled to see that a bus company from the Central Coast Hunter region is already looking to move its fleet of buses to hydrogen. And we are going to see more and more hydrogen as part of the heavy vehicle energy and transport mix. I also had the privilege and the absolute pleasure to work with Energy Renaissance and turn the sod on the first ever lithium ion battery storage factory being developed in Australia. Now, for those that don't understand the importance of this, what this means is when we start to develop lithium ion battery storage, we're actually in a position to capture energy. So those one in four households that currently have solar panels, as Australia has led the way in solar panel uptake, by bringing into the mix, particularly at the household level, lithium ion battery storage, you can then harness that energy. You can hold that energy that's created at two o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's at its highest and use it when you're watching Netflix at 9.30 that night. So by using storage facilities and that storage becoming cheaper and more portable, we'll see household emissions reduce. But we do understand that heavy industry, aluminium smelters, require affordable, reliable base low power. That's why those opposites saw the resignation of the absolutely fantastic member for Hunter, whom I am going to miss, Joel Fitzgibbon, when he stood aside, because Joel knew the importance that coal was going to play in this energy mix for a substantial period of time to come. Coal's not going anywhere soon. I know it upsets these guys. No, they are very upset about it. Coal is going to be with us for a while. You know why we need it as well? Not only for our heavy industry, it's actually racist to want to take it away because our coal helps developing nations move their countries forward. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, well, who is in charge of your climate plan uh, this week in Canberra? Who is in charge of the government's climate policy? Uh, at the start of this week, everyone thought that it was uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce, actually leading the government's plan uh, on net zero, uh, of course, to the complete horror uh, of most Australians. But now what we hear uh, from the government uh, is that Mr Morrison is back. He's back in charge. Uh, but the question is, is he really back in charge? Uh, he's cl clearly not so much back in charge that he feels confident that he can take his plan for net zero emissions to his joint party room for sign-off. Uh, and he is not back in charge quite enough to even dream of legislating net zero emissions because he cannot count on the members of his own government to vote for that plan. The Prime Minister he's not in charge enough to keep the Nationals in his coalition government remotely in line. 
He's not in charge enough to stop his own Deputy Prime Minister from issuing threats, threats of a very hard time for the government ahead. He is not in charge enough to stop the Nationals from issuing threats that things will get ugly, threats that were doubled down on by the Leader of the Nationals in the Senate today when Senator Mackenzie repeated these claims that things are going to get ugly in the government on climate change policy. The Prime Minister is not in charge enough to stop the threats to undermine harmonious government. He's not in charge enough to stop the threats to undermine cabinet solidarity coming from the members of his own team. He's not enough in charge to stop the threats of members of his own government to resign from that government. Uh, and the Prime Minister is not in charge enough of his resources minister, Mr Pitt, who still refuses to say that human-induced climate change is actually real and actually happening. Uh, and all of this today, all of this, this complete mess, Senator Rustin describes as a respectful discussion, a respectful discussion. I mean, you would hate to see what a backroom brawl looks like for this coalition government, if this is a respectful discussion. Perhaps the government should be more supportive of the Respectful Relationships program uh, in our schools, and perhaps some of the members of the government should go back to school and take a few units of that course if they want to learn how to have respectful discussions. But apparently this is how it's done in the Morrison government today. This is how they deal with the biggest challenges that we face in our time. At 10 minutes to midnight, literally days away from Glasgow, days away, days away from one of the biggest decisions that this country will ever make. The people of Australia don't even know who is in charge of our climate change plan, our climate action plan, just days away from COP26. The people of Australia don't know who is in charge of their jobs, of jobs for the future. And what the people of Australia do know is that their government is in complete meltdown at one of the most critical times in our country's history. They are in complete meltdown. They are a complete shambles, a complete stinking mess. They are a hot, steaming mess right now on one of the most important issues that our country faces. And all of that after eight years. Eight years for a stinking mess, 10 minutes to midnight. That is the best that this Morrison government has. That is what they have to offer on one of the biggest challenges that we all face. But as we all know and as Australians know, it's always too little, too late with Mr Morrison. Uh, and it is Australia's workers who are actually paying the price, because there is a global race on right now to seize the opportunity that climate action provides us. But we know how the Prime Minister feels about races. He doesn't like to get into them too quickly. And this is just another race that the Prime Minister is losing for our country with absolutely catastrophic consequences. This government is a complete stinking mess when it comes to action on climate, a complete steaming mess when it comes to the jobs of the future Senator that we Walsh, should be embracing. Your time has expired. Hold on a moment, Senator Faruqi. The question before the chair uh, is that the Senate take note of answers by Senator McKenzie and Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I rise to take note of the response of Minister Seselja to my questions on climate finance. The world is cooking and the Morrison government is sitting on its hands. No targets, no plan, no action. And while nature may not have intended to discriminate, geopolitical boundaries that divide the world into the global south and the global north make sure that patterns of systemic discrimination continue as the impacts of climate change, natural disasters, and pollution fall disproportionately on communities in low-income nations. The insatiable appetite of wealthy nations like Australia to dig up and burn coal, oil, and gas is sealing an unpalatable fate for billions of people around the world. We are witnesses to an intergenerational and global theft 
that will deprive future generations the opportunity to make a dignified life, and where countries least responsible for the climate crisis are already living through the worst of it. Pacific Islanders are watching their homes and their homelands sink as their very existence is threatened by sea level rise, flooding, and coastal erosion. Their children and their grandchildren will bear the brunt of Australia's inaction. They've urged the Morrison government to take urgent action on climate. They have pleaded with us. They have condemned us for our weak and unambitious targets. They are demanding we honor the Global Climate Accord. In 2009, during the Copenhagen Accord, wealthy nations committed to 100 billion US dollars in international climate finance funding each year by 2030. But they have fallen far short of this. They have failed the nations on which they have used, which they have used as a dumping ground for their greenhouse gas emissions. Australia too has failed to pay their fair share of climate finance and reparations commensurate with our historical and ongoing contribution to the climate crisis. The Liberal National Government has not made a single payment to the Green Climate Fund since 2018. Today, a group of NGOs have called on Australia to rise to the challenge and immediately double climate finance contributions to $3 billion over 2020-2025. That's the very least we can do. The Greens believe that we should add another $1.5 billion to this in direct reparations for the damage already done. The inequality between the global north and south is rooted in the exploitative, extractive, and destructive legacy of colonialism and imperialism. This is an issue of global justice. It is about righting historic wrongs. These payments are not a favor bestowed. It is a debt owed. But the Morrison government is not at all interested in honoring the commitments to the Green Climate Fund or paying its fair share of climate finance. Australia is dead last on climate action out of 193 UN member countries. It is so embarrassing, sad, and heartbreaking to see that we have become such laggards on climate action and protecting the environment. When the world was debating solutions to climate change, the Liberals were still fighting over whether it exists. Now we are in the critical decade, and the world has moved on to talking about 2030 targets, but the Liberals and Nationals are fighting over 2050. Public poll after poll reveals how the vast majority of people living in Australia want real action on climate. Even that is not enough to wake the Liberals up from their climate stupor. But they are getting better at greenwashing, like their partners, the News Corp media. They're both trying to rewrite history with their miserable commitments on the one hand, while still pushing dirty coal, oil, and gas on the other. Here's a news flash for you. No one has forgotten that News Corp and the Liberal Nationals blocked climate action for decades. It's time to stop digging up coal, gas, and oil. It's time to stop handing millions of dollars of public money over to billionaires, hoping they will save us from the climate crisis. This is utter stupidity. It's time to aim high, to legislate 75% emissions cut by 2030 and net zero by 2035. It's way beyond time to take responsibility for the role that we have played in creating the climate crisis. We must fulfill our obligations. We must pay our fair share. Let's go to Glasgow COP26 with our heads held high as leaders, not as outliers. It's time for climate justice. The question before the chair is that the Senate take note of uh, answers from Senator Sezelja, uh, Minister Sezelja to Senator Faruqi. Those that opinion say aye against say no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day?